You're listening to the Astrology Hub Podcast, practical wisdom for living your life on purpose. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Astrology Hub Podcast. My name is Amanda Poole Walsh, and I'm the founder of Astrology Hub, and I'm here with astrologer and senior editor for Astrology Hub, Donna Woodwell. And on today's episode, we are bringing on an incredible guest. I think that you're going to be very, um, very interested in all the different things that he has to say. We cover everything from misconceptions about astrology to how astrology can actually practically be useful in your life to astrology and consciousness and then astrology and relationships. And the whole path of the conversation was just so interesting and really um, hard to stop. (laughs) We probably could have gone for a, a couple hours. Today, you know, that, that's the thing about Rick is that he is like a feast of astrology. There are like the most epic smorgasbord ever where you get to go in and have a little bit of this thing that's wonderful and a little bit of that thing that's wonderful. And then you never want to leave the smorgasbord. Oh my gosh. So true, Donna. So just a, a little background on Rick. He is a brilliant speaker, lecturing and facilitating workshops all around the world. And we're talking about Rick Levine, by the way. We're <laughs> using him by, by his first name only because so many people are familiar with him already. But uh, Rick Levine, he's the co-founder of StarIQ.com, a founding trustee of the Kepler College of Astrological Arts and Sciences, Sciences and co-author of Barnes & Noble's annual Your Astrology Guide. And his daily horoscope column was read by millions of readers for nearly 17 years through tarot.com and Yahoo, AOL, Huffington Post, LA Times, BeliefNet, and more. Rick lives in Seattle, where he sees clients, writes, and explores the hidden mysteries of the cosmos. He's a modern-day wizard, like in real life. He's amazing. Donna, what was your favorite part of our conversation with Rick here today? You know, more than once in the conversation... I felt myself tearing up because it was personally relevant to my life. And so, and that's the thing with talking about Rick. He's not only a master astrologer and he's been doing this for so long. He's so tuned into the human experience that every time you talk to him, even if you just talk to him in the hallway of some conference that's going on in the downtown of a big city, he speaks to you like specifically to you and it makes things resonate. And so it's hard to pick just one thing. I get back to the smorgasbord. It's all good. good. So true, Donna. And, you know, towards the end of the conversation, we, we turned the focus to relationships and astrology and relationships because Rick is going to be our inner circle guide, astrologer guide. And the inner circle is our membership group. He's going to be our leading guide in September and October of 2019. And his whole lunar cycle, his whole month is going to be focused around relationships. And I hear what you're saying. The thing that's amazing about him is he is such an incredible astrologer, but he is so attuned to the human experience. And so it really makes for a great coach or guide that can take, you know, the the language and the information of the cosmos and bring it to us here on life and here on earth and make it easier for us to, to navigate our lives, but also realize that we're not crazy and we're not alone. I mean, we had a whole conversation around projection in relationships and how this happens and why this happens and using astrology to understand how and why this happens. And it just, you know, it helps to alleviate some of that feeling like, God, am I crazy? Like I keep doing this. I I keep finding myself in relationships where this happens. It's like, no, you're not crazy. And this is kind of part of it. You know, this is kind of what we're doing here that's what makes him such a a true guide on the journey because yes, he comes from a place of great deal of wisdom and his own self-reflection. But on the flip side, you still feel like you have a companion on the journey and he doesn't place himself on some pedestal that is unreachable. And and that's what makes his wisdom so personable and, and easy to connect to because he's, he's still one of the people on the journey. You found yourself in tears and I found myself smiling pretty much the whole time. So hopefully uh, his talk will evoke some some deep emotions for you as well. And we know you're going to enjoy it. Uh, Before we dive into that talk, just a reminder to check out the forecast for this week. If you go to your podcast list and you see that we released a forecast on Monday, 
you can get tuned into the energies of this week. And also a reminder to check out episode 001 and 002. If you're interested in hearing how Donna and I actually got to this place where we're having these conversations with you, you want to get a little intimate viewpoint into our lives and our story, that is covered in episode 001. And in episode 002, we give you the foundations for this show. So in, um, we define terms like astrology and zodiac. And you know, so if you're, if you're finding that sometimes we're using words that you're not quite understanding, and or to one of the points that Rick makes, when we say astrology, you might be thinking of something very different than what we mean by astrology. So if you'd like to know what we mean by these terms, please check out zero, uh, episode 002. And uh, we look forward to connecting with you again after you enjoy this interview. Well, Rick, I'm so glad that you are joining us on this first episode of our podcast because you truly are one of the world's ambassadors for astrology. I think you may have spoken to more people about astrology than pretty much anyone else on the planet who's alive right now. So we are so grateful to have the benefit of your wisdom. And with that, as you have literally traveled the world talking about astrology, what are some of the things that you've learned when talking to the normal people and the muggles and talking to the true believers? Well, I think the most important thing that I'm aware of all the time is that when I say astrology and when the unwashed others, the muggles, the them, when they say astrology, we're talking about two very different things. And if we keep that in mind from the beginning, we're okay. But if we think that they think astrology is the same thing that we think, we're not gonna, we're, it's going to get off to a bad start. Okay, so you left out that raw meat on the step there. So what do they think and what do we think? Well, first of all, who they are depends on what they think. But they start off with thinking that astrology is crap, that it's bullshit, that it's non-scientific, that it's unreligious, that it's damnable, um, that it's silly, that it's superstition, um, that it's based upon generalities of everybody is, you know, one of 12 people. And that's just a start. I mean, that's, that's, that's a start of what they think. Um, they don't understand the the concept of archetypes. They don't understand the relationship of individual to environment. They don't understand that astrology is one of the mm, most sophisticated mapping systems and personality classification systems that ever existed. They don't understand that all those people who uh, are students of modern depth psychology and or what we call Jungian psychology, what Jung called analytical psychology. They don't understand that that is all part of an outgrowth of the astrological tradition. People don't understand that the Myers-Briggs test, which most people who do personality assessment work understand that, they don't understand that that is astrological in as much as it comes from Jung's psychology. He called it not a he called it analytical psychology or the psychology of four types. Let's be clear, the four types were fire, earth, air, and water. And this is not me making it up. This is, you know, Jung basically built his psychology on the Greek concept of humors and the mixing of the four elements. So in order to even start a conversation, we have to step way back and help people understand that what they think astrology is, is not what we think astrology is. You know, Rick, one of the things that's astounded me as I've talked to astrologers over the last few years is how complex and nuanced and rich and how intelligent, highly intelligent astrologers are. And so I think when you're talking about Myers-Briggs and some of the, the more popular personality tests, it's like, They've been able to take the complex language of astrology and kind of water it down enough so that most people can kind of get it. How do you, how do you see us bridging you know, more people to the rich astrology um, without everybody needing to have a PhD or you know, be metaphysicians or you know, really scientifically inclined and all those things? 
So one of the questions that I like to ask people and of myself, is it necessary for me to know how to change the oil in my car or do time, uh, correct the timing, set the timing of my car or change the spark plugs in my car in order to know how to drive it? And there was a time when if you owned, if you were a pilot, you would have had to have built your damn plane. Now, you know, pilots get into a pre-made plane and away they go. We get into a car when the car has such complexity, we don't know how it works. Uh, We know how bits and pieces of it work, but we just get into it and we drive it. We know how to drive it. I think astrology has gone through and is still going through a similar change. If one was an astrologer 500 years ago, one would have had to go out into the night sky and sight the planets, bring them into their sight and figure out where they were. And then they would have had to come back and do days of calculations in order to um, uh, create a chart. Even 75 years ago, 50 years ago, one still would have had to know how to do interpolation, solve spherical triangles, look up tables of houses, Um, it would have been much more complicated than it is now. So I think astrology has been through a bit of a shift. And I think that we're really just getting going. My sense of what astrology will be in five or 10 or 25 years, we will have a system, I I, I refer to it as TPS. Uh, We all know what GPS is. GPS is Global Positioning Systems that basically allow us to know where we are. And if we know where we're going, a GPS system will tell us the best route to get there. TPS is temporal positioning systems. And I think this is where astrology is heading. I think at some point in time, everyone will have applications. And we've seen the front end of them now. But everyone will have applications that will not tell them where they are and where they are going. It'll tell them when they are and when they will get there. And it's a slightly different orientation because, you know, as I often describe to people who don't know what astrology is, I describe astrology as a mapping system, except instead of mapping space, we're mapping time. And just like if you had a physical three-dimensional representation, a map, of the United States or Google Earth of the Earth, if you had a map of where things are, the map doesn't tell you where you're going. It only tells you the lay of the land. And if you know where you are and where you're going, the best route to get there. By the same token, astrology does not tell you where you're going. It does not tell you your directionality. It just simply says, here's where you are in time. Here's where time will lead. What are you going to do in the interim? Rick, you are talking about timing and how astrology helps us understand when we are and get the lay of the land in terms of the the actual timing of things. And you've spent a lot of your life creating forecasts or horoscopes. How do you see that benefiting people in their lives when they have an idea of time, of where they're at in time and when they're going to get to said destination? How does that actually help them live a better life? Well, I think astrology can help people live a better life by helping people have a sense of who they are, where they are, when they are, and all all of those things. It's not just a matter of timing, although that's what I spoke about so far, because obviously astrology is also the part of astrology that most people know best, or think they know best, is the part that's I'm an Aries, you're a Capricorn, you're, uh, you know, whatever. Um, And this has to do with personality typing, with characteristics of people, with strengths and weaknesses. And this is a significant part of astrology. So it's not just the timing. And my experience is that, let's say that you were born um, 300 years ago into a family where, you know, you had a little plot of land and, um, and, and your dad was a um, shoemaker, um, repaired shoes. There wasn't much difference as far as, there weren't many choices as far as where you could go in life. 
you basically helped out doing the chores. You learned your father's trade if you were a male. If you were a female, you learned how to cook and clean, and then you were sold to a, a someone else. Well, it was a dowry system, but look, let's face it, it was a form of, of, of slavery, of being sold. But the fact of the matter is that let's say you were born with Mercury retrograde conjunct Pluto, and let's say you had this amazing perceptive mind and you went to these incredibly deep places and that your mind was always working at six times the speed of anyone else's and, and, and deeper than anyone could imagine. You had nowhere to go with it. Uh, it eventually would probably make you crazy because you had to live in this linear one dimensional flat world where there was no such thing as be yourself or human growth or, you know, or, or, or consciousness, these things were not even known. You just had to, you know, get up and do your, do your job for the day. If someone was able to tell you, look, this is what's going on. And this is, this is the, the piece of the universe that you channel and you're not crazy. It's just that everyone else is looking at things on a, on a linear basis. And you're able to go to deeper places than any, just knowing these things would help you survive better. You wouldn't have to do anything about it. And by the same token, I think that most people who see clients understand the reaction when you touch something that a client has felt their entire life and no one has understood. And people think, clients think, oh my God, you understand me better than anyone, better than my husband, better than my wife, better than my shrink, whatever. The fact of the matter is that when people can identify how they feel with the zeitgeist of the universe at a particular moment, um, that can be a gift. Um, I often feel, and I've had long discussions with, with some very well-known astrologers, um, uh, Noel Till, for example, um, is a fierce um, um, opponent of using astrological jargon in consultations. I am a fierce opponent of not. In other words, I don't want to jargon up a conversation with a client so that they don't know what the hell I'm talking about. That's not my intent. However, if a client of mine was born with Mercury retrograde lined up with Pluto, if they leave that session with only a clear image of the cosmos on the day they were born of Mercury close to the earth, strong, powerful, retrograde, and lined up with Pluto, the Lord of the underworld, the Lord of the unconscious, if that's something that they can take with them, they'll have that for the rest of their life. They'll understand a little bit about their place in the universe. And so from that standpoint, um, I think that the strength or the gift of astrology is, um, is giving people an understanding that where they are, who they are, when they are, is not just the fabrication of their aberrated subconscious, you know, fears or whatever, that these are all, that it's based on reality. And, and I have to say as a string, you know, you know, as a logical conclusion of this little kind of string of thoughts that I've developed here is this, people say, can astrology change the future? Can knowing your astrology change the future? And I say, no, it can change the past. It can change the present, and that changes your trajectory, which in fact can change your future. We can't change our future just directly because we're operating from a trajectory. We're operating from a, this is my past experience, this is who I was, this is where I am now. And, and, and people are often surprised at my take on this because they go, what do you mean change the past? The past is fixed. You know, you change the future. It's like, no, the, the future is much more fixed than the past. Um, the past is changed all the time. That's why we do therapy. That's why we do historical research. You know, at one time in the United States, I grew up, we grew up um, believing that Columbus discovered America. This is a major and magical and wonderful thing. Only to just find out, you know, years later, that America didn't need discovering. It was doing just fine without Columbus. And, that, um, and, and so the point is that we change our history. Um, and people go, no, no, but history is fixed. History only exists as a memory. And the same thing is true in our personal history. 
we are limited in our present moment by our perceptions and our experiences of our past. And if we can help a client understand their past trajectory, it can free them to make more choices in the present moment, which can then alter their future. Wow. Amen. I love listening to you. (laughs) Wait, so this comes back to the idea that I know is also close to your heart of consciousness. So, Rick, could you define what you mean when you use the word consciousness and how this relates to your sense of what astrology is and how it works? Consciousness is awareness. And one can be aware or conscious of things out there, and one can be aware or conscious of things in here. In fact, one can be aware that the things out there and the things in here are one in the same, and the whole damn thing is a trick of a mirror. So here's the thing about consciousness. We, most of us, grew up learning that we are human beings and that we've developed consciousness through evolution. I think that many of us now hold the belief that is um, very basic to many of the animistic cultures around the world, um, certainly um, in Balinese Hinduism and Tibetan Buddhism and many other systems of thought. It is well understood that everything in the universe is conscious. Consciousness does not require physicality. Consciousness does not require a meat, meat like like steak. It does not require a meat body. We live in in a meat body, and we are conscious. Um, At death, consciousness I remember Ram Dass once saying, talking about a conversation he had with a good buddy of his who happened not to have a body, a spirit named Emmanuel, that he'd talked to for many decades of his life through a medium, through various mediums. And he said to Emmanuel once, he said, Emmanuel, um, if you had one and only one thing to tell me about death, what would it be? And Emmanuel says, Ram Dass, if I had only one thing that I would want you to know about death, it would be this. It's perfectly safe. Now, we are taught that death is the end. And I think it's difficult to talk about consciousness unless we at least mention the the gateway of death and the other gateway of birth. Because consciousness comes in and out of physicality, but it exists fine without it. Rudolf Steiner um, introduced into maybe what we would call the German astrological thought, the idea that every planet is, a con- is conscious, um, that the sun, that, that uh, Mars, every planet has a consciousness. Every plant, every animal, every rock, every galaxy has a consciousness. So in my way of understanding the universe, I believe that we are localized Um, radio receivers, transceivers, we receive and we we send uh, frequencies. The frequencies that we are attuned to can be mapped out by a chart at birth. When you look at a birth chart and you see, when you, we, we look at planets, but planets are not things, they're frequency vibrations. The moon is 13 cycles a year and Saturn is about three cycles a century, and Pluto is about four cycles a millennium. These are frequencies, just like FM radio is 101 um, um, million megahertz, million cycles every second. The universe consists of uh, of a band of, of frequencies, and we hold a particular note, which is our personality, it's who we are. So if the universe consists of frequencies and we consist of, of complex um, sacks of dielectrically charged particles in sacks of livers and hearts and body organs and, and so on, we're receiving certain frequencies and transmitting them. We are actually like, like on the middle ground, we're holding a position 
Um, it, it's been said that we move through time, and I think it's actually more correct that time moves through us. But the bottom line is this, that understanding that everything is frequency gives us the ability to tune our little radios so that we can uh, choose which stations to listen to, which stations to pay attention to, and which stations to broadcast on. However, the only thing that we can change is consciousness, is awareness. There's nothing else that can be changed. This is a basic concept of yoga, that when we change our awareness, our awareness, our consciousness gives us the ability to make other choices. We go through life limited by the worldview that we have. A wonderful book written in the, maybe in the early 60s by a psychologist named George Kelly called The Theory of Personality. And in it, he basically says that each and every person has their own worldview. And your worldview basically is what limits your choices at any given um, change, at any given time. And that the job of a therapist is to help a client or a patient alter their worldview, because most of us have closed our worldview down based upon certain experiences or fears or whatever that limit our choices. So it's by changing our view of the world, we can have more choices. This is basically changing our consciousness, changing our awareness, changing our awareness of self. Now, the problem with, with talking about consciousness and self is this little division that we have that we learn to understand by the works of Sigmund Freud is that there's a little bit of a barrier between the part of ourself that we're aware of and the part of ourself that we're not aware of. And the ego um, is a construct whose job it is to survive. Now, I know in a lot of modern spiritual techniques, um, the idea is to get rid of our ego. That's great. But remember, the ego is the part of us that makes sure that we're fed and watered and have you know, money to pay the rent and so on. The ego is the part of us that is, that is um, given the job of long-term survival. On the other hand, it's also really important to know when that ego is extra weight, where we do not need it. Um, Trungpa Chogyam Rinpoche, the um, Buddhist uh, who founded Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado, kind of a crazy wisdom master of sorts. Um, one of my favorite lines of his is this, enlightenment is the ego's greatest disappointment. It's brilliant. Enlightenment is the ego's greatest disappointment. But you see, if we're conscious of our ego, we can learn tools and techniques to not have as much invested in it when it's not necessary. On the other hand, if we're in a life-death situation, in a situation of survival, if we're driving our kid to school, if we're, if we're um, working a job, ego is really important because it's the ego that navigates our way through the world of knowing that we're going to survive, not just be washed down to the back into the sea of consciousness by the river of, you know, of energy that just flows until everything goes back into the sea. So would you say that a person's personal astrology chart, their personal map is a representation of this worldview that they carry around with them? Yes. In fact, I would say that, it is that, but there's another trick here. And that gets back to the question of what are we, who are we? And we identify as our charts. Um, we identify our clients as their charts. But it's important to remember that, uh, let me put it this way, it's important to remember not to confuse the map with reality. Maps are representations. A chart is not... When people go, oh, I can't do that, I'm a Taurus. That's bullshit. That's crazy thinking. If you're a Taurus, you're coming from a particular point of view, and astrology offers you 11 other ways to frame something. We're not stuck by who we are. It's just the awareness from where we're coming. Now, um, a, a chart does show this, but we, it's tricky because when we look at a chart, we see the sun in, we see the moon, 
we see Mercury retrograde. We see Venus square Saturn. We see these planets as, as reality. And the fact of the matter is that the chart actually consists of 99.9999999% empty space. That if you took the entire solar system and said, what does it consist of? It doesn't consist of the Sun and Jupiter with their huge masses and Saturn, Uranus, and then all the other planets added in. No, it consists of emptiness. The planets are aberrations. And so when you look at a chart, and I always do this exercise with a client, and if you look at a chart and you take out each of the planets one by one by one by one, what you're left with is awareness. All, all the planets basically show where our awareness is bent out of shape, where we're tweaked and leaned toward this way of thinking or that way of thinking. When you say to someone in the true meaning of the word, when you say namaste, what you're really saying to them is, hey, I have a chart and you have a chart. And when I get past all my bullshit, when I take out my sun, my moon, my Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, when I take out all those planets and you take out all that noise and all those planets out of your chart, we are the same. That's just beautiful. <laughs> and it actually brings us to something that I would love for you to speak to next. You're going to be our inner circle astrologer guide in September and October of 2019. We are so excited to have you. And that lunar cycle, we're going to be talking about cultivating balance in relationships. And so I'm looking at your new moon affirmation and your full moon affirmation and I'm seeing that um, the new moon is going to be all about, I'm always responsible for my feelings. And the full moon is, I am more helpful to others when I attend to my own needs first. So just tell us a little bit about what you're going to be covering and how astrology in general, and then how specifically what we'll be talking about that lunar cycle can help us in our relationships. Well, okay. First of all, relationships are a tricky thing. Um, I, I seem to have Ram Das on my mind today. Ram Das calls relationships the yoga of the West. You know, it's a practice. And most of us do well at it for short bursts of time. Um, you know, those short bursts of time can be a year or 20 years, but, they're, but relationships are tricky. And, be, and the reason they're tricky is that they, when we enter into a relationship, and I don't only mean a love or intimate relationship, I mean a relationship with our parents, with our children, with our siblings, with our bosses, with our friends. Every interaction we have is a relationship. Relationships are tricky because when we're interacting with someone, it's difficult to tell where I end and where you begin. It's difficult for you to tell where you end and where I begin. Even if it appears, even if the ego has it parsed out well enough to know this is my stuff, that's your stuff, it's just not that simple. And, uh, and I think we really need to go back to one of the major contributions of Freud in order to understand what we step into when we step into the land of relationships. And Freud developed a concept that we take for granted now. Many people use the word, they throw it around. Most people don't really fully understand what it means, but the word is projection. And that, and it's very simply from an astrological point of view, it works like this. I have, um, 10 planets or so in my chart that I know about. I have a, probably another, oh, I don't know, another 150,000 points of things that are going around the sun that I don't know about. NASA knows about them, but I don't know about them. I don't know what they are or what they do. Some of my contemporaries, I think, have a good sense of maybe another thousand of them. Um, some people who use named asteroids can up that number you know, to six or eight or even 10,000. But the fact of the matter is that there's all this stuff going on and I know about some of it. Every, every planet, the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, um, every speck of dust, every planet just wants to be heard. It just wants a voice. 
And when a planet doesn't get its voice, it doesn't do well. So if you have a chart where you have, um, I used earlier Venus square Saturn as an example for something I remember. If you have Venus square Saturn, it's possible that your Venus in Sagittarius um, square um, Saturn in um, Pisces, it's possible that your Venus square Saturn makes it so that Venus doesn't have a voice as well as it would like. It feels a bit restricted. What happens when any planet isn't expressing fully? That planet, parts of it become unconscious. If we do that because we don't like the trouble that Venus and Sagittarius gets into, therefore I'm not going to tell this person that I think he's hot or she's hot, that is suppression. If I know I'm doing it, I'm suppressing it. Venus is not getting expressed because consciously I don't like the results of what happens when I express it, so I hold it back, that's suppression. Anyone says, if anyone says, oh yeah, I, I, I do that, but I, I, I'm aware, I, I know I repress that all the time. If you know you do it, you're not repressing it. Repression is unconscious. Unconscious is something that is, how do I say this? Unconscious. You don't know you're doing it. If you know you're doing it, it's not, it's not repression. You can't say, oh yeah, I repress that, because if you say you know you're doing it, you're suppressing it. It's a point that makes me crazy when people mix those two things up. But the fact of the matter is that whether you do it consciously, suppression, or unconsciously, repression, the result is the same, projection. Because anything that's not expressed pops out, it like flips out. And so that instead of it being inside where we now have it in one in denial, Instead of not being aware of it on the inside, we bump into it on the outside. And on the outside, we either like it a lot or we don't like it a lot. Whenever anyone says, oh, I hate that, or wow, I really, really, really love that, that's probably tied up to some piece of, um, of, of projection because it's, it's buzzing with something on the inside. When we meet someone, their planets buzz with our planets. In astrology, we look at this, we call this synastry. And those planets that buzz, whether they buzz um, harmoniously or discordantly, right now doesn't matter. When, when your planet grabs one of mine and or vice versa, it creates a connection. Bzzz. And that connection in some way is going to elicit projection. So the reason why at the Libra um, lunations, that at the, especially at the Libra new moon, why it's so important, and then and the, the Aries full moon, why it's so important to understand this balance is this illusion that we have that we're going to fix things out there. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times when something out there needs attention and we can do something very useful by stepping in, you know, and, and getting someone to the emergency room. Uh, by just saying the right words. I mean, there are things that we can do by giving someone who needs it a hug. Uh, there are things that we can do that have a very important impact. This is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that if I don't take care of my own energies, then I have nothing really to give anyone else. Because the only thing that we have to give to anyone else is our awareness and our consciousness. If we're not showing up whole, then we are we're being a half hole <laughs> and, and 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 it's and, it, and it's not nice to be a half hole um so i think here that with with this lunation cycle the and this is not about being selfish in from the standpoint of not acknowledging others it's being selfish enough so that there is a self to show up when we enter into any sort of relationship Man, it's like so simple and yet so challenging. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I think, uh, you know, it's it makes so much sense. And the way you just described it is so clear. And yet we find ourselves in these cycles over and over and over. Over, over and over again. Over <laughs> and over again. Why yeah. do you think it, relationship is so hard for us? You know, the, why does it take so much work to find that balance and then keep that balance? And, you know, why do you think it's so hard? Uh -huh. 
We're in it together. Oh man. Well, we have all the answers. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. No, I, I'm the question astrologer, not the answer astrologer. Uh, I have, when clients call up for answers, I tell most of my clients, you don't have enough money um, and, and there isn't, and you're not clever enough to get me to answer a question for you. You see, if I answer a question for you or for a client, I'm really good at answering things. I know it. I'm good at it. But if I answer a question for you, you have my answer, not yours, and my answer stops your process. That's the last thing in the world as an astrologer I want to do. Now, I go around with this with some pretty well-known and well-respected and very intelligent and very competent astrologers who tell me that's crazy thinking. My clients come for me, come to me for answers, and I'm going to give them answers. They want to know, should they buy the house? Should I marry this guy? Should I, you know, whatever? And, and I look at their chart and I tell them. And I tell my clients, I will refer you to those people to give you answers. I will not. Because um, it, it, when, when you get an answer from the outside, it stops the process. You know, it's like the ultimate answers. I'm sure most of us have friends or, or previous friends that in some way we've lost um, to Scientology, Nam Yoho, Renge Kyo, Jesus, or something. Because when someone gets the answer, they don't ask questions anymore. That's it. They're done. They're, and, and I think to me, that's, that's, that's death. Um, so no, I don't have the answer. Of, um, I, there's no magic key to relationships. Um, and, uh, and yet, uh, I'm in. I, I'm not one to become jaded or what's the word, um, um, you know, um, cynical um, because something doesn't work out. I mean, we ask what makes a successful relationship. And, um, and for most people, whether they verbalize it or not, longevity is what makes a successful relationship. And that's just crazy thinking. I mean, I do know people who have been together for 50 years and who are incredibly in love and in a deeply powerful, amazing, um, sharing, beautiful relationship. But that's the exception. I know people who have been together for 50 years who probably should have called it a good weekend. Um, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and we enter relationships for different reasons. And it's complicated because when we meet someone who, who hums, who vibrates, who meets us, with 10 or 20 or 30 or 60% of that which we would like in a partner, we let go of the other 90% or 40% or whatever, and then we figure out how we move through life having let go of parts of ourselves. Um, and I think that, that sometimes it's the process of remembering our dismembered parts, the part that we you know, cut off in order to make a relationship work that is sometimes very painful and also sometimes very um, exciting and growth oriented at the end of a relationship or in that place in between relationships. Relationships are complicated because other people put our shit right in our faces. You know, when we're alone, we can kind of continue in our own ways and we can justify things, we can rationalize things, but when we're in relationship, it gets a bit trickier and um, and my hat's off to anyone who has, you know, the courage to enter into a relationship um, in whatever form they may. And my hat's off um, also to the people who have the courage to say, I'm not doing a relationship right now. I'm basically creating that relationship with myself. And that is just as viable a path. Hmm. Rick, it's going to be so fun to go deeper on this topic and explore with you next year. So thank you so much for giving us a little taste of your perspective. Um, and I'm sure many people are resonating with everything that you've had to share today. Um, Don, is there any question that you'd like to wrap up with? Uh, Rick can come to my house anytime and I will feed him his favorite treats just so I can listen to him talk because every idea leads to another area of fascination. So as long as he comes back in the future and I can feed him treats, I'm good. <laughs> so, That's good. Then, then so am I. Fantastic. All right, Rick. So for people that want to learn more about you, where should they go? Um, these days, I think probably the best place for anyone to find out what I do 
would be to go to Patreon, and that's patron with an extra E in it, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Rick Levine. So it's www.patreon.com slash Rick Levine. And that has my free offerings and along with other subscription videos that I'm offering these days. Brilliant. All right. And we're also going to be featuring Rick on our upcoming 2019 forecast marathon event where we will be joined by 13 astrologers who will take us month by month through the energies of 2019. Registration for that is opening up very shortly. And if you would like to be notified when we're notif- when, when that is live, please make sure and sign up for alerts about this podcast. And we'll make sure that you get the information as soon as it's available. Now, it's a marathon for you. It's only a sprint for the 13 of us. Exactly. Yeah, I guess it says, well, and for the audience, it might be a marathon too, depparing on how long they can show up for. But yes, it's a sprint for you. All right. Thank you so much, Rick. It's been such a pleasure to have you. And we really look forward to all the opportunities to play together throughout 2019 and beyond. Thanks so much. Wow. That was such an inspiring conversation that we had with Rick Levine today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as Amanda and I did. And we also hope that you will tune in next week. We have a very, very special episode with Carolyn Elliott. Uh, She is the founder of Witch Magazine, and we're talking all things winter solstice. So next week, the content episode for the Astrology Hub podcast will be released on Thursday, which is the day before the winter solstice. We go through some incredible ideas for creating your own rituals, for really infusing meaning into not only the winter solstice, but this whole entire time of year. So check that out. That's, that's going to be released next week. But then also the Monday before, you will get your weekly forecast. So check that out. That, that will be released on Monday. If you want to receive alerts when our podcast goes live, please make sure you sign up for that. The link to do so is in the show notes. So thank you everybody for tuning in today and we look forward to connecting with you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Astrology Hub podcast. We can't wait to continue exploring with you and bringing you astrology's most practical wisdom so you can live your life on purpose. We'll catch you on the next episode. Hi, this is Chris Kaplan, the producer of the Astrology Hub podcast. This episode is over, but check the show notes for links to products and services you've heard about during this episode. And if you enjoyed our show, please subscribe and rate using the subscribe button wherever you listen to your podcasts.